So it's nice to see you all. Uh, Mary, the M&M concert last night was totally brilliant. It's really, really good. That's saved my memory for a long time. So I want to talk about uh, circadian rhythms, metabolic health and neurodegeneration as an introduction. But I'm going to talk about the molecular clockwork of the suprachiasmatic nucleus, our body clock, and then some recently published work on how we're using uh, genetic complementation to study the properties of the SCN, um, and then using a new technique we call translational switching to make these manipulations conditional, and then finish off with some work uh, on the role of astrocytes in the SCN. So to start off with the beginning, um, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, Bambus Kuriaka and I did an experiment, and this is him with the Premier trophy, League Trophy that Leicester City won. We did an experiment way back, last century. It really was, a long time ago. Um, and we just collected liver tissue from mice under free-running conditions. So these mice were in continuous dim red light, not on a light-dark cycle, so they were operating on the circadian time. And we used what was new technology at the time, customised DNA microarrays, and this is what we found. These are all these transcripts, which depend on when you collect them from the animal over the course of a circadian cycle, they're highly rhythmic. These were all phased to have a peak at what would have been dusk, the anticipated light soft, but as I say, these are free-running conditions. And in a, another set of transcripts, in the same samples, they were equally rhythmic, but they had an inverse pattern. So they're all peaking at predicted time of lights on at, at dusk. And we discovered that something like 15% of the transcripts we could measure with these microarrays were under circadian control. And that really is the starting point to consider how the clock will influence metabolism and other functions of the organism. This is more recent data. This raster plot from Uli Schibler's group shows the same uh, phenomenon effectively. Each line represents one transcript. You see the transcripts are expressed at high level, low level, high level, low level. In this case, over the course of a 48-hour, two-circadian cycle collection time. So the liver transcriptome has waves of expression going through it. All the activity of particular genes is time-stamped to follow in a particular program. And uh, Bambus and I followed up this transcriptomic analysis looking at the uh, hepatic proteome using, again, at the time were sort of cutting-edge techniques, but now they're pretty blunt-edge techniques by comparison. But what we found there, just give one example of the urogenesis cycle, um, if this doesn't function effectively, you die. But what we found was that proteins involved, rate-limiting proteins in this cycle, uh, at the protein level now, are all under tight circadian regulation. So the competence of the liver to deal with uh, the ureogenic genetic cycle varies under the influence of the circadian clock. And in fact, one can expand that. I've taken this image from a review by Robert Dolman, simply to make the point that all, metaboli all metabolic functions of the liver vary through circadian time. What the liver does metabolically in circadian day is very different from what it's able to do in circadian night. And this program is there to adapt us to the day-night cycle. So this is simply make the point that the body's a 24-hour machine, and these data demonstrate that circadian rhythms are directly and explicitly linked to metabolic efficiency and thereby to health. So if timing of metabolism in relation to the feeding fasting cycle which is a consequence of the sleep wake cycle is important then it's not surprising to learn that for example shift work is where this timing mechanism will be disturbed a much greater risk of metabolic and cardiovascular diseases sleep of course is one of the outputs of circadian clock and it's of interest to this conference explicitly not all sleep problems are circadian in nature but one particular sleep problem, and going back to that issue of neurodegeneration, is the disruption of sleep-wake cycle in dementia. Here's a healthy age patient. This is actimetry data, very nicely consolidated, active in the day. The, pay, uh, the uh, volunteer, in this case, is uh, in sleep, asleep in the bed at night. This is an Alzheimer's patient living at home. And you see this normal pattern of order is completely disrupted. But this begs the question of what's the direction of causality here? Is the disease simply causing circadian patterning to be dissolved, and that's the end of the story? Or is there something more interesting going on? Neurodegenerative diseases are characterized by aggregations of normally soluble protein. They're diseases of proteostasis. This is the life history of the protein schematically. We have expression, we have 
translation, the protein is folded, it's modified in various post-translational ways, and then ultimately it's degraded through the proteasome or through autophagy if it's part of a, an organelle. In neurodegeneration, this life history is perverted, and the proteins go on a, a toxic gain-of-function pathway as a consequence of environmental cues, aberrant phosphorylation, whatever you like. Ultimately, the proteins which should be soluble aggregate, and then in fact those aggregates then spread from cell to cell, propelling the disease through the nervous system. <coughs> I've gone to the trouble of showing this simply to make the point that all of these processes that govern the life history of the protein are under control of the circadian clock mechanism. And so the conventional ways to think, well, disease progression will compromise the neurons, and of course that will cause circadian incompetence. But if we have circadian incompetence, regulation of these processes becomes dysregulated. It's more likely that the protein will go onto this trajectory. And of course, what can happen then is circadian incompetence will compromise proteostasis and accelerate degrees disease progression. So there's a reciprocal interplay between clock and sleep and disease progression. It's not just a one-way street. And this will lead to a, an invirtuous positive feedback circle um, that needs to be explored. Now, I'm supposed to talk about metabolic and neurological disease. I wanted to set that as an introduction that I've just given to you, but I'll leave it now to these speakers. And I'm sorry, Natalie, I couldn't find a photograph um, uh, to put on here, but these people will be revisiting that theme later on in the meeting. So what I want to do now is go back to the question of how are all these innumerable local rhythms controlled? I want to investigate the molecular clockwork of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So this is the working schema. So whether we're looking at peripheral functions that are rhythmic or looking at uh, brain-dependent functions that are equally rhythmic, they're a result of local rhythms in tissues which are governed by local clocks. Those local clocks are in turn synchronized by endocrine, autonomic, and behavioral cues, which ultimately derive from the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's the central pacemaker in this system. Here we see human brain scan. There's the third ventricle. Here's the optic chiasm, and the SCN is at the bottom here. And on a mouse brain section, you can see this uh, in situ image uh, reveals the position of the SCN very nicely. So this is the general light and train pacemaker, because in all this system, this is the sole mechanism for input of the light-dark cycle. And that's something that Russell will come back to, I'm sure, later on. So it's a light and train pacemaker that sustains and synchronizes this vast array of rhythmic events across the body and across the brain. We know it's necessary if the SN is lesion, this is a, a normal intact mouse. It runs in the anticipated circadian night. It's inactive in circadian day. If the SN is ablated, then there's no circadian control to behavior. We work an awful lot with organotypic slices of mass suprachiasmatic nucleus. This is the optic chiasm. This is the third ventricle. Here's a recording electrode. And here you will see, <laughs> here you see an amber light. I've only been going 10 minutes. Um, if you record from the SCN in a dish, in its night phase, it's firing at a low rate. In its day phase, it's firing at a high rate and into the next night rate. So in a dish, it will define for itself 24-hour cycles. And we can see that definition in the form of the actual firing frequency. A, a new approach to do that is to load up the SCN with a calcium uh, reporter. And if we do long-term imaging of calcium levels in the SCN, you can see very nicely here isolated in culture, in static culture, a beautiful circadian cycle of intracellular calcium, which reflects the fact that this is an autonomous 24-hour clock. So how does it work? It's already been mentioned that the story starts with Ron Konopka and Seymour Benzer, uh, who identified uh, a genetic locus in Drosophila, where mutations made the, made the flies arrhythmic, or they had a fast circadian period or a long circadian period. And all these mutations, as they map to the same genetic locus, which they termed uh, period. And that really, moving sort of 40, 50 years later, brings us to the uh, Nobel Prize awarded last year, Jeff Hall, Michael Rosbach, and Mike Young. And they were able to unravel the mechanism behind the circadian timing system of flies. And they're able to show, and this is one of their seminal papers, that in fact, the activity of the PER gene was regulated in a negative feedback loop by its products. Now, more recently, 
Of course, that's created a great deal of attention in the mammalian field. In fact, Joe Takahashi has been instrumental in defining the molecular mechanisms of the circadian clock in mammals. And this is the basic scheme. Again, it's based around a period uh, negative feedback loop. Now we have period in mammals partnered with another gene called cryptochrome. And under the expression, of, under the influence of clock BMAL, the uh, period in cryptochrome genes uh, expressed, transcribed as mRNA, translate into protein, and the protein goes back into nucleus. So you, this delayed negative feedback loop is the core of the circadian oscillation in mammals. Of course, in the SCN, somehow it's got to engage with the firing rate mechanisms, and we know that there are a whole series of clock-controlled output genes, including ion channels, which are also subject to this periodic suppression by period and cryptochrome proteins, which lead to the, ultimately to the expression of circadian cellular functions. So can we see this clockwork ticking? So one approach, first of all, is to look at the activity of these E-boxes, because this is the pivot point whereby clock and BMAL drive expression and period and cryptochrome inhibit expression. So we created uh, a reporter mouse in which we took the E-boxes from the CRY1 gene and put downstream of those E-boxes firefly luciferase. And then as a transgene, we, we can make uh, organotypic slices of mice carrying this reporter. Here's the uh, optic chiasm. This would be the third ventricle. And this is now looking at the same field of view uh, with a CCD camera to look at bioluminescent uh, uh, activity, which is a function of the luciferase expression. So all these bright areas here you see are cells which, in which the E-boxes are active and therefore luciferase is being produced and therefore bioluminescence is being given off. And as with the calcium imaging, we can now do time-lapse bioluminescent imaging and follow this SCN slice in isolation, in this case for 10 days. And what we're watching here is the E-boxes being activated, suppressed, activated and suppressed in a self-sustaining loop. So if that's the E-boxes, the argument is that this oscillation in gene activity is being driven by periodic abundance of the period in cryptochrome proteins. So how to visualize, the, the, in this case, the per proteins. And this is work done with Nicholas Smiley with Andrew Loudon and colleagues in Manchester, in which we made a mouse where we had the fluorescent tag uh, Venus, a yeah, uh, yellow reporter, in a fusion with the PER2 protein. And now this is an organotypic slice from a PER2 Venus mouse. You can see here again, optic chiasm, third ventricle up there. And the yellow signal tells us it's PER2 protein in those cells at the time of recording. And then again, we can follow as this circadian cycle goes through its daytime, nighttime, <coughs> daytime, nighttime oscillation, we can see the proteins being produced and then degraded, produced and then degraded. And this mouse can also be used to look at peripheral circadian oscillations. See, so these are now fibroblasts imaged. And if you watch one particular fibroblast, you see PER2 is produced and then degraded, produced and then degraded on a circadian cycle. So that same mechanism which we see in the suprachiasmatic nucleus is also present in just about every cell in the body. So that makes this uh, an extremely complex, challenging, but of course a very elegant biological system. Um, innumerable clocks, but all of them regulated by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So that does beg the question, what makes the SCN special? Well, its connections make it special. As I said, it's the only part of the system that receives input from the retina. And its connections make it special insofar as it projects to, and we don't know the full details on this yet, but it projects to the various pathways that lead to control of the uh, peripheral clock mechanisms in other tissues. But also, it's extremely robust. And so we want to explore the actual cell autonomous and circuit level functions of the SCN by manipulating its <coughs> genetic complement. So this, again, is the feedback system. What happens if you take away cryptochromes? Well, if you take away cryptochromes, you break the timer. Here's a wild-type mouse on a light dark cycle, put it in constant darkness. You see this beautiful circadian rhythm as the clock takes over the controlled behavior. This is a mouse lacking cry one and cry two. It looks fine on the LD cycle, but as soon as it goes into DD, because it has no molecular clockwork, its behavior is arrhythmic. And if you take the SCN from such mice, instead of having beautiful circadian oscillations of gene expression, we see that they're disorganized. There's no oscillation there to speak of. So what we want to do is use this background, this incompetent background, and then see to build up the mechanism and what can the mechanism 
uh, uh, impose on the rest of the animal. And to do that, we have a, an AAV where the minimal CRY1 promoter, that minimal promoter driving luciferase just seen, drives the expression of CRY1 with an EGFP type on it. And this is work done by a, a, a former PhD student who's now at UCL, uh, Matt Edwards. So this is bioluminescence from a CRY deficient SCN, and you see there's very little circadian organization. And then Matt puts on that AAV, and within 36 hours, you've got a beautiful oscillation established. So by putting CRY1 back into a CRY deficient SCN, you restore the clockwork. So it's all there, it's all ready to go, it's just like in cryptochrome. And what's really nice is if you look at the period of the oscillation, in this case it was putting CRY1 back in and that generates a very long period oscillation. If you were to put CRY2 back in, that works equally well, but that gives you a short period oscillation. And we know from previous studies this is genotype appropriate. So this is actually demonstrating that the rhythm you see is a consequence of the cryptochrome protein you put back in. So that's proof of principle. If we can do it in a slice, can we do it in vivo? So this is the model. Normally we have all these parts of the brain. If you take them out, they've all got beautiful local oscillations because they've got local clockworks, which are normally synchronized from the SCN. In the cry deficient animal, all these clocks are broken. So the experiment now, using the virus, is to restore the clock function in the SCN and then ask the question, what happens to the behavior of the animal? It's circadian organization. What can the SCN, when it's the only clock in the organism, do? So this is work done by Liz Maywood. This is just histology to show you that the AAV expression is working. We've got cry with the EGFP tag on there. This is uh, a representative animal. It's cry double knockout, so it's arrhythmic when it's in DD. At this point, it's on the LD cycle for surgery. The AAV has been injected, and then it goes back into DD. And you see, after a week or so of disorder, we see after a week, this beautiful circadian behavior emerges as a consequence solely of putting cryptochrome back into the SCN. And again, it's got this long period, which proves that the behavior we see is a consequence of the cry one protein that's being expressed in the SCN. So if we've got a uniquely competent SCN alone in the organism, what can that do? Well, what can it do to the control of sleep? So what you're looking at here is REM as a percentage of total sleep. So it's not the absolute amount of REM, it's REM as a percentage of total sleep. In a wild-type mouse, you see that's nicely circadian in the blue line. In the cridable knockout, we see that that circadian control is gone. Now, if you look at the mouse cridable knockout that's been now uh, injected with the AAV, we can see that the circadian organization is restored. Now, if I were to tell you it's as good as wild-type, you'd say, oh, no, it isn't, and it clearly isn't. So this restoration isn't complete. But if we compare the green and the red lines, we see that there is circadian patterning there. It's just not as intense as in the wild type. So what this tells us is that a molecularly competent SCN can impose, albeit partially, circadian control of the percentage of REM as a function of total sleep in an otherwise clockless mouse. Does that matter for the mouse? So if we look at um, novel object recognition memory, we can see here the training phase, two objects. The mouse will spend 50% of the time at each object because they're both novel. And then in the testing phase, you give one new novel and one familiar object. This is the wild type mouse on the test phase. We can see that it spends a lot more time at the newly novel object because it's not seen it before. This is a cry double knockout. This is interesting in and of itself. A cry deficient animal just can't learn this test. If you have a cry deficient animal and just put in a, a control AAV vector, that has no effect. But if you put in the AAV vector into the SCN alone with the cry one EGFP, you see that restores behavioral function. So this opens out lots of possibilities. What are the efferent pathways of the SCN that control this uh, circadian regulation of REM sleep, this circadian regulation of novel object memory? Because it's incomplete, it tells us that the SCN alone can't make things perfect. So there must be a contribution of the local clock, the cryptochrome dependent clocks in local tissues in all of this. But it also shows us a general point that we can use genetic complementation as a tool to explore the functions of the SCN and the SCN system. So can we make that tool conditional? That's where I want to go on to this idea of translational switching based on genetic code expansion. So this is uh, work uh, developed from 
Jason Chin's lab at the LMB. Uh, this is normal translation, so you, you charge the tRNA with amino acid using the tRNA synthetase, and then the anticodon of the tRNA recognizes the codon on the mRNA that brings the amino acid into line with the growing peptide chain, and it, that's how you produce proteins. You're all familiar with that. What Jason's done is that he's recoded things. So he has a, a tRNA synthetase and a tRNA which now will recognize a non-canonical amino acid. Not one of the 20 amino acids that nature normally uses, but a different amino acid. And he's also engineered it so that the tRNA will recognize the amber stop codon. Now, normally when you have an amber stop codon in the mRNA, that stops by definition, that stops translation. But using these reagents, it's possible now at that stop codon to incorporate not a normal amino acid, but a non-canonical amino acid into the growing peptide chain. So this is a mechanism called amber suppression, and it's a way to control the expression of proteins of interest. And in our case, the novel amino acid is a derivative of lysine, it's alkyne lysine. So as I say, Jason developed the toolkit, so we have an AAV where the synapsin promoter drives the tRNA synthetized with an M synthetase with an M cherry tag, and here's a copy of the modified tRNA. Then we have a reporter gene, which carries a cDNA for a gene of interest, in this case GFP, but you can see it has the amber stop code on halfway through it. So under normal circumstances, the mRNA from this construct would not be translated. But we can show that the toolkit works. These are SCN slices. This is an untreated altogether slice. This is a slice that got the, both the AAV constructs, but it didn't get the novel amino acid. So there's nothing to put into that uh, position, that stop codon. So although we've got the tRNA synthetase AAV expressed, we get no GFP. Whereas in this slice, we do provide the alkyne lysine, we do provide novel amino acid so we can get translational read through, and here's the GFP report to tell us that. So this is great because this translational switching gives us conditionality to a protein of interest. The protein will be expressed or not expressed depending on whether we give the tissue this novel amino acid. So let's do it with something more interesting. Let's do it now with cryptochrome. So replacing the GFP with the PRI1 eGFP construct, which you saw previously, but now that construct has within the uh, CRY1 coding sequence the amber stop codon. And of course, it's now driven by the CRY1 promoter rather than the synapsin promoter. So we now have triple conditionality here. We've got the synapsin promoter, so the synthetase and the whole mechanism will work only in neurons. We've got the CRY1 promoter, so the product will only be produced on a circadian basis. And the product will be translated or not translated by a function of whether we provide alkyne lysine. So these are cry-deficient SCN slices that Liz May would set up. This is bioluminescence. This is absolute level of bioluminescence. This is background subtracted. If you now, or if Liz now gives the alkyne lysine to the culture medium, it's now possible for that construct to produce cry-1 with the EGFP tag on it. And so we now get beautiful oscillations. Wash out the alkyne lysine, it all stops. It's repeatable now with one millimolar instead of five millimolar alkyne lysine. So it's reversible control of the circadian clock through this translational control of the expression of CRY1 protein. And it's nicely, as one would hope to see, it's nicely dose dependent. If you look at the period of the oscillation, we see here over the range of 0.3 to 10 millimolar, there's a very clear dose dependent control over the circadian period, which reflects the dose dependent translation of cryptochrome 1 protein. So translational switching confers conditional control over the cry-dependent SCN slice clockwork. Take it in vivo. So now these are brain sections from uh, a mouse that received the two AAVs, and the uh, M-cherry is the uh, report for the synthetase uh, vector. The EGFP, this is the tag on the cry-1 protein, so that's demonstrating that translation is effective. And I'll just point this out because uh, an added advantage of this mechanism, you're putting a novel amino acid into the protein. So you can introduce all sorts of chemistry into that protein of interest. And in this case, the alkyne lysine, you, you can use a, a click chemistry uh, to, to, to tag onto it with a, a fluorescent reporter. So this click signal tells you explicitly that the alkyne lysine is sitting in the cry one protein. So... This is the arrhythmic mouse. It goes under surgery. 
After surgery, it's got alkaline lysine in the drinking water, and as we'd hoped to see, just as you saw with the SCN in the culture dish, you've got a beautiful circadian rhythm established. Take the alkaline lysine out of the drinking water, the system falls apart because no longer can cryo-warm be translated because uh, the amber stop codon can't be read through. And then put the alkaline lysine back in again and it all starts up for a second time. And these are just data. The circadian periods here are all over the place, pre-surgery, they're all over the place when the mice are on vehicle, but when they're on alkaline lysine, you've got beautiful consolidation of circadian rhythms. And the actual amplitude of those rhythms is, is, is very high compared to control treatment. So, so it works very nicely. What does it tell us? The circuitry within the SCN, which cry functions to control circadian behavior, is specified independently of cry expression. Okay? This mouse had never encountered cryptochromes until the translational switching started. So cry is not a developmental component of the circadian system. The period of the clock is set by a dose-dependent concentration of cry 1. And the circuitry that controls circadian function is labile, as is molecular clockwork, labile. You can toggle it on and off literally within hours. It's there, ready to go, as long as it has cry one protein. And also, because we're using a synapsin promoter to drive that synthetase expression, this shows explicitly that a competent molecular clock in SCN neurons alone is sufficient to drive circadian behavior. So, excuse me. There are very many ways in which this technology can be taken. We're just using it as a tool to manipulate the circadian system, but having that ability to control the expression of the protein of interest solely by providing a novel amino acid to the experimental tissue, to the animal, or indeed to the patient, you know, has got a lot to uh, offer. So having said that neurons are so important, I want now to finish off about the central role for astrocytes in SCN timekeeping. And this is work done by Marco Brancaccio, who's in the audience. He's recently uh, set up his own new lab at Imperial College as part of the Dementia Research Institute. Um, and yes, he's looking for good recruits to his laboratory. So if you're interested in doing the type of stuff I'm going to talk about here, you should speak to Marco. So there are astrocytes in the SCN as well as neurons. And you can see them here expressing GFP and the function of a GFAP promoter. And what Marco did was... He did the calcium imaging that I've already shown you in neurons, um, but he's, now he's doing the calcium imaging in neurons in the red channel and the calcium imaging in astrocytes in the green channel. And he made this startling discovery. The red oscillation, you've already seen that at the start of the presentation. We know that the neurons in the SCN show very strong circadian oscillations in intracellular calcium levels, and that's related to their electrical activity. But if you look in green, there's an equally robust circadian oscillation of calcium levels in the astrocytes. But you can see it's differently phased from the oscillation in the neurons. We have two cell populations in the SCN circuit, but the differentially phased cellular clocks, as reported from this calcium signaling. Is this an artifact of calcium? Or has it got something to do with that core feedback mechanism? So what Matt Edwards did before he left the lab was he took that cry one luciferase uh, reporter construct, but he flexed it so that it will only be active under the influence of Cree-directed uh, recombination. And then what Marco was able to do was to take this conditional Cree luciferase reporter and combine it with the Cree driven by synapsin or the Cree driven by GFAP. So he could look at the cryoluciferase rhythm in neurons or in astrocytes. And then he also had to supertransduce the slices with the GCAMP reporter, reporting the neuronal calcium rhythm. And that would then make it possible to phase relate the rhythms he got in luciferase from neurons versus luciferase in astrocytes. And these are the data that he got. So you use the neuronal calcium rhythm to register in time the luciferase reports because it's the same reporter in different slices. And then if you look at the neuronal cryon luciferase in red, you see it here, 
and it's in a phase that we would anticipate. We're expected to see this. But again, the surprise is luciferase report for the, that core molecular feedback loop in the astrocytes, which is in blue. Yes, it's beautifully rhythmic, but as with the calcium rhythm, it's out of phase from the neuronal luciferase rhythm. So the core molecular pacemaker in astrocytes is running perfectly well, but it's got a different phase from the core molecular pacemaker of the neurons. So we've got differentially phased neuronal and astrocytic circadian clocks embedded in the SCN network. Are these astrocytic circadian clocks important? So then Marco was able to do the genetic <coughs> complementation by putting CRY1 EGFP back into SCNs, but again, we wanted it to be either into neurons or into astrocytes. So now this, this uh, CRY1 EGFP construct, which I was showing you about in the previous studies, is, is flexed, so it will only be functional under influence of Cree recombinase either in astrocytes or in neurons. And this just shows that it works. You get targeted expression of CRY in the appropriate neurons. I'm now going to show you perluciferase, a neuronal calcium, in a CRY-deficient SCN. So it should be disorganized. But in this particular SCN, CRY1 is being expressed in the astrocytes. Now, I hope you can see it with the lights. There's a nice circadian rhythm in perluciferase, and there's also a very nice circadian rhythm in neuronal calcium. Even though these neurons do not have cryptochrome, the cryptochromes in the astrocytes, when those astrocytes become functional, they're driving activity in the neurons. And if you just plot what's seen there, we can see a very nice uh, uh, calcium rhythm in this slice, followed phase delayed, as we'd expect to see, by the perluciferase bioluminescence rhythm. So astrocytic clocks alone can drive the SCN neuronal oscillation, okay? If they can do that, what does this mean for circadian behavior? So then what Marco did was to repeat what, well, not to repeat, but to do in a similar way to the way Liz had, to inject the SCN of cry-deficient mice with his constructs to achieve targeted expression of cry-1 in those mice. So this is a control condition uh, where uh, the, uh, <coughs> uh, it's just a control condition, so we've got an arrhythmic animal to start with. Ignore this when the animal's on a light-dark cycle. The important thing is when it goes into a second DD condition, there's no circadian organization when you inject control vectors. And that's because there's no pre-recombinase here. This is the expected outcome if you express Cry1 in neurons, so we're using synapsin Cre to express Cry1. This is an arrhythmic animal beforehand, goes into surgery in the LD cycle, comes out of the LD cycle into DD, and you see a very nice long circadian period emerges, equivalent to what we saw with the experiments that Liz was doing. It's got a long period because it's being driven by Cry1. But the important thing that Marco did was to target in other animals the expression of Cry1 to the astrocytes using a GFAP-driven GFAP pre-recombinase. And it's the same pattern, uh, arrhythmia beforehand into surgery, and then in the DD condition afterwards, we see their circadian behavior in these mice where the only cells expressing cryptochrome are the astrocytes of the SCN. And these are just summary data. Uh, this is a control condition, nothing really happens. This is the neuronal condition where the animals show a very nice long period when the cryptochrome is expressed in neurons. But here we see the condition when the cryptochrome is expressed in the astrocytes. Beautiful circadian behavior comes out of this. Interestingly, the period is not as long as it is when you do the neuronal restoration. So there's some things about relative potency, if you like, of astrocytes and neurons in this system. But the principle is there. Following on from what you can do in the SCN slice with astrocytic expression of CRY1, you can see the consequence of that for the animal's behavior. So this is the model we're working on, that in fact the SCN is, if you like, a duplex cellular system. It's made up as a network of both neuronal and astrocytic oscillators. They must be able to communicate with each other because they maintain very strong phase relationships. We don't know how the neurons drive the astrocytes. Marco's got intriguing ideas 
and the role of glutamate being a signal from the astrocytes to keep the neurons in tune. But this is still an open question as to how the two cell populations operate one to the other. But the general point to make is that we see astrocyte to neuron signaling is it actually establishes a mutually supportive circadian network. You know, and is this, in addition to neuron to neuron signaling, is this the origin of the beautiful precision and stability of the SCN timing mechanism? And of course, there's a wider relevance here for neuronal astrocyte signaling across clocks in the brain. Is this mechanism reprised in the cortex, for example? And what's the relationship of this mechanism uh, to processes such as neurodegeneration, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning? So these are the elements I wanted to talk about. I'm on red, so I'll just move from there to say these are the people in, in my group, and in Jason Chin's group, um, Matt Edwards, who uh, started the uh, complementation work now at UCL. Uh, Ryan's gone to uh, uh, California, postdoc in California. And of course, Marco, as I say, is now at Imperial College at the DRI, setting up his own lab, and he's looking to hire people. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And a demonstration, I think, of some super tools to be used in all kinds of questions. And mm. Yep. We have a Jason, yeah, yeah. I can speak loud. <laughs> so the, the rescue of the SCN clock, yeah. mm. how and that rescues behavioral rhythm. Mm. What about other what about other coordination of other rhythms? Yeah, in the, well, in yeah, the animals, how much can that yeah. rescue everything? It's, yeah, it, it's a work in progress. We've been trying to look at rescue, for example, in female mice. You may have, that, the actual I showed you was a female mouse, actually, because it had the four-day estrus patterning in the wild type. Um, we've been trying to see if we can get estrus uh, rhythmicity back in female mice using the same method, and I can't, it's too early to say whether it does or doesn't work. But yeah, that's the question. We want, how far can we push this? And it may be in a simplistic way, particularly with that REM sleep, and remember that, that, that was not the occurrence of REM sleep. The measure I showed you was if the animal is asleep, how much of that sleep is REM? It'd be interesting to know, it, it, we've got a sort of 50% effect there, but we've not got it back right. So if we were to put cryptochrome back into another nucleus, you know, a, a sleep regulatory nucleus down the line, could we push it to 100%? So it's really, how far do we have to move down these pathways to make the system as effective as we would expect it to see? And yeah, it's a work in progress. Uh, Mick, I've got a, a question about the circadian circuitry. So you had these nice experiments where mm. you rescued with mm. that translational method mm. with the double cry. Yeah. And that was the synapsin promoter. So yes. Uh, uh, my textbook knowledge of this is that these cry things are themselves got these circadian promoters normally, right? Don't they? The, the cry genes themselves have like female oh. clock. And so now you've just, you, are yeah. you saying all that is mm. redundant for the clock? Yeah. No, 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 no. That no. was I, a core yeah. part of the yeah. clockwork. I didn't explain myself, Bill. The construct that we're using to drive cryptochrome expression has a minimal cry one promoter driving it. The, the, the synapsin promoter was being used to drive the uh, tRNA synthetase. Okay. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. This, this might be quite a naive question, but um, based on sort of clinical experience, what happens in aging in the model? So if you try and do it in an older thing, <laughs> cell or mm. mouse or whatever, have you tried that? Does it work as well? That's a very good question. No, we, yeah, so we'd have to, for example, we'd, we'd have to age cry deficient mice and then at an old age see if, you know, the SCM was still as resilient if we put cryptochrome into it as it is when you put it into a young mouse. And I know when I've spoken to people that do animal work yeah. before, the, the issue with that is the expense of aging the animals. Mm. But mm. it's so important in human work because of all the things that happen as you get older. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, we've not done the experiment. Be, be interested to find out. Yes, just, again, it's, it's going on from Jason's question. How far can we push this? But there we're pushing it in developmental time rather than pushing it in, you know, physiological space. Yeah. 
I mean, do you even know that those animals will live uh, quite long? Do you have any sense of their lifespan? No, because the experimental protocol, of course, we, we, we will, yeah, we could, actually we could do that. We, we've got more cohorts being produced and we could just put someone on the shelf and just see, uh, yes, does that system actually break down or is it a permanent repair? I mean, I think yeah. it can be a good regulation mm. in place. Yeah. Uh, mm. Last question. Yeah. What, about <coughs> what about other glial cells like oligodendrocytes and... It's an open question. Do you want to say anything, Marco? The question is, what about other glial cells like oligodendrocytes? Well, we don't know anything about it. <laughs> okay. But we do know that the cryptochrome wasn't expressed in oligodendrocytes. It was, it was it, No, no, it's, it's GFAP promoter. And yeah, we did cross-staining to confirm that. So it is an astrocytic function. But it, it came on the back of a discovery that Marco made using a glutamate reporter glue sniffer that first revealed as a, a, a circadian rhythm of glutamate. Uh, in the SCN slice, and that led to a whole series of experiments which focused, took the attention into astrocytes, glutamate being a gliotransmitter. That was a line of inquiry. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much indeed again, Michael. <laughs>